Bitcoin's opposite, right? It's natural opposite is government bonds. And that's where all the risk is. And that's where like the perfect hedge is as well, because government bonds are not just one thing, right? There's a 30 year treasury and there's a, you know, 30 day T bill, right? And so the length of that bond, uh, the yield curve like that, that matters to a client's balancing. If they're going from, Hey, I'm going from Bitcoin to a 30 year treasury, like, okay, you're that that's a different move than Bitcoin to like a, a 30 day note or a money market fund, right? That holds treasuries. So the most natural opposite and often how we're counterbalancing a client's Bitcoin position is with that cash or that really short term, um, treasury. Alrighty, uh, Jesse, I'm really excited to have you on the Bitcoin Magazine podcast today. And for the audience who does not know, uh, Jesse Gilger is a certified financial planner and a senior advisor at Sound Advisory. Um, Sound Advisory is a financial advisory firm for the Bitcoin era, and they're focused on creating financial plans for individuals with Bitcoin in mind, as well as providing investment management services. Um, and so today when we're chatting with Jesse, we're going to be discussing financial planning through the lens of Bitcoin. Um, and we want to try to understand how this asset plays into financial planning as it's obviously relatively new. Um, and the financial planning industry traditionally comes from a traditional finance background. Um, and Jesse's also going to help us understand how strategies around tax and retirement planning that Bitcoin investors and investors generally um, can use to maximize their returns and minimize tax implications. Um, so really excited to have Jesse on today. I think he's an excellent voice to add to this conversation. Um, and I think we're all going to be able to learn a little bit more about how to take a bit more of a long-term view um, of Bitcoin as an investment, um, which is generally always the objective here as we lower our time preference. But um, with all that said, uh, Jesse, how are you doing today, man? Thanks for coming on. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk. Awesome. Cool. So I think before we get into the meat and potatoes of this conversation, um, I was just hoping you could tell people a little bit more about your background before you joined Sound Advisory and even before you discovered Bitcoin. Um, I know that you've been in the wealth management industry and financial advisory business uh, since about 2013. Um, and so, yeah, just wondering if you could give us a little bit more context of, you know, where you're coming from professionally and if you've been like aware of Bitcoin this whole time um, <laughs> during that, that period in your career. Yeah, certainly not aware uh, starting out. So a little over a decade ago, started 2013, a more of a, a sales shop, probably a, a two name you know, shop that everyone's heard of and sold mutual funds door to door. And it was really um, a sales experience, but not, in my opinion, the best way to to help people from a financial planning perspective. So yeah, very sales early on, and then just gradually went deeper down a financial planning rabbit hole and found Bitcoin in about 2017 for myself. And then for clients started allocating them around 2020, uh, when things became clearer through COVID that, um, Bitcoin was a solution that a lot of people didn't really know that they needed. Yeah. And so I want to unpack that piece about like in 2020, it sounds like that was a turning point for you on Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what was it about 2020? I mean, I, I'm sure I can guess given, you know, the, the fiscal stimulus that we experienced um, as well as the monetary policy changes that, that occurred then. But we'd love to hear more just from your, your perspective, what that was like and really what uh, made that click. And I think the reason I asked this question is um, there's a lot of financial planners out there and a lot of them don't understand or even engage with Bitcoin. So um, I think this is a good opportunity for them to, you know, see someone like them, um, mm -hmm. you know, understand Bitcoin, because I think obviously we're still very early, but uh, this context, I think, can be very helpful just from a social standpoint. Sure. Yeah, 20, 2017 was really just learning for myself, right? The technicals, could this work? A lot of questions, a lot of skepticism. And then it was really March of 2020 um, when you see three trillion dollars printed in a you know overnight while while we were sleeping. Um, it was very visceral to clients when you say like, "Hey, we we work every day for dollars, right? And we're putting real value into the world." And then some people can snap their fingers and create three empire state buildings full of hundred dollar bills like instantly. And I think that really like hits home. Like, yeah, I'm working hard. This isn't fair that some people can do that. And so what's the answer, right? Money's broken and hard money, gold, 
Bitcoin, these things start to make more sense when you when you understand the problem, right? Money is broken in a sense that it's unfair, uh, that money can be created and really that purchasing power or stolen uh, from clients. So that's when it became real and you had something to specifically point to and say, hey, look, this happened. I think we need to allocate at least something to a solution. Yeah, and I, I think we're going to unpack a little bit more of how Bitcoin uh, in the context of fiat currency stacks up as an investment. And um, I think you've identified obviously this inflationary dynamic of fiat currencies, but that also impacts the market uh, in, in a very you know obvious way. Um, but I think that that's going to help us understand you know why folks who are trying to plan their financial future need to at least consider Bitcoin or its ramifications in terms of their investment strategy. Um, but I also want to just give folks a little bit more of an understanding of like what it is that financial planners do. I, I think like obviously creating financial plans would be a good place to start. Um, yeah. But we'd love to hear from from your professional perspective. Like you know what are what is Sad Advisory doing in terms of financial planning? Um, and wealth management. Yeah, oftentimes when people think of a financial plan or, or financial advisor, like, oh, it's the investment portfolio. And that's certainly a piece, but there's so many other pieces to a client's financial life, right? And you have the, the friction of tax, you've got to live somewhere, so people have to answer some sort of real estate question, whether it's rent or buy. Some people are given stock through their company, so they've got, you know, equity in a plan. And it's not clear how all of these things fit together, right? And so that's what, in my opinion, a good financial planner does. Hey, where are you at? Let's speak specifically to your situation. You've got all these moving pieces. Let's organize them and let's come up with a strategy and plan that's going to get you to your goals more efficiently. So very vague. It looks different from person to person. And there are a lot of moving pieces, but that's what makes the career so fun and rewarding because every case is different. Every client's aiming at something different. And they're dealt a different hand, right? And so it can be very engaging. Like, oh, it's fun. Let's dive into, you know, some days it's a 29-year-old accumulator and they've got the the world by the tail and they're, you know, earning and growing. And then in the very next call, it can be, hey, um, you know, we've been retired for a while and health is now into great, like we're looking at passing assets to the next generation. So it can vary, um, you know, hour to hour, call to call, but that's, that's the fun part of the job It's just, hey, what is this puzzle? You're presented all these new pieces and you're really trying to help client guide, you're guiding that client to a more successful outcome. Yeah, and I, I think something that really is unique about your work is that there aren't, too, as far as I'm aware, too many financial planners that really have a deep understanding of Bitcoin. Um, and I know you previously worked with Unchained um, and Sound Advisor uses Unchained's collaborative custody um, model as a means of securing Bitcoin for clients that that you know choose that appropriate route. Um, but are there other folks like you out in the financial planning world that like have a, a Bitcoin forward perspective? Um, it seems relatively rare to me, um, just to given you know my heuristic analysis. Yeah, I think the short answers would be it is relatively rare, but yes, they are out there. Uh, they try to stick together. So as a part of a group called the Bitcoin Financial Advisors Network great people. Um, there's not many of them compared to the other financial planning networks. They're not nearly as large as some of the other more traditional finance networks, but slowly and the more independent uh, advisors are starting to get there and make it a core offering to their their advice. Yeah. And um, I guess also I'm curious if in your background and previously like wealth management and financial planning, like were there folks from your life pre Bitcoin that have seen that you, you know, started working in Bitcoin. I'm um, like, what is their response been? Hey, responsible Bitcoiner. Long term Bitcoin holders could be leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't have a sound financial plan and tax strategy. Sound Advisory is a leading financial advisory firm for long term Bitcoin holders like yourself. They can help you maximize your Bitcoin wealth while navigating the complexities of the legacy financial system. Don't get killed on taxes. Check out Sound Advisory at thesoundadvisory.com for more information. That's thesoundadvisory.com. Now back to the show. Yeah, they've definitely seen, uh, they've reached out more recently, and I think it's starting to change from ignore to skepticism, right? Now, bull markets can tend to do that when you have such aggressive price moves. Um, people just have questions like, hey, okay, well, I thought, I thought Jesse was crazy, right? Like, why would you build an invite, you know, that takes Bitcoin seriously? it's ridiculous. And now, 
not as ridiculous, right? Um, those things that people and Bitcoiners have been saying during the bear markets, like, hey, no, I think that there's another a cycle or waiver. This is still reasonable based on what I see. The fundamentals haven't changed. It really is like price that instigates my my calendar and people texting and reaching out and saying, hey, I've got some questions now. So I wouldn't say there's adoption in the traditional finance industry yet. Uh, it's coming. Things like the ETFs help as well, lend credibility to um, this being a reasonable asset for client portfolios. So the education always starts somewhere and I'm just trying to help clients and other advisors like, hey, what's that next right step for you to learn? But yeah. It's happening. I'm hopeful. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, the number of people interested in Bitcoin seems to go up in uh, as the, as the number of Bitcoin's price denominated in fiat goes up. Uh, unsurprisingly, I suppose. Um, and I think that yes, like there is kind of this component of hey, the number is going up. That's good for your investment goals. Um, but I also think that you have a pretty, um, I guess, nuanced perspective on what Bitcoin represents as a portion of a client's portfolio. Um, you wrote a piece uh, in Bitcoin Magazine, uh, and it's titled "Your Financial Plan May Be Riskier Without Bitcoin." Um, and it's it's not, and I think it's notable because it's not saying, "Hey, buy Bitcoin, number go up, it's good for your portfolio." It's this is a risk management strategy, um, and I think that uh, it, that perspective is um, interesting to me. Like I, I assume that this is kind of how you can frame Bitcoin to clients um, when you know they're still learning about it. Um, so yeah, I guess on that note is like, what is that framing process? Like, I, I assume that there's a wide spectrum of folks, those that are like, Hey, I get Bitcoin. I want Bitcoin. Um, I understand the investment thesis, so at least how I interpret it, but there's also probably a cohort of folks that are like, I don't know, like it sure. The number goes up, maybe it increases like the sharp ratio of my portfolio or something, but they don't mm. really understand why Bitcoin as an asset does what it does or what it represents. So. Um, I was hoping you could unpack that article a little bit more and, and just kind of share your perspective on like, yeah. what is the the reason why to hold Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I wrote that one for someone um, who is still skeptical or early to their understanding, right? Um, the initial questions, hey, what is this? Why should I own it? Um, very different from someone who's been seasoned for years, right? And they, they know why. That, so this is the article for why is this reasonable? Um, colleague and friend Parker Lewis had great talk recently, you know, Bitcoin is not a hedge. Um, and I was, I was chatting with him. Don't know if he remembers this or the last conversation, but I'm like, Hey, it's not just a hedge, right? Cause that's how almost everyone starts out. Like I see all these problems in the existing system. I want to hedge that. And then, so they start with typically a small chunk. Like I don't see too many clients like, yep, I went straight to the deep end, full blown Bitcoin maximalist, like day one. It, it just never happens, right? They're learning. They ask initial questions. And they're like, oh yeah, I agree with the problems. I think there's a reasonable solution. I can't be 100% sure that it's not going to win. And so I'm going to start with a, a percentage that makes sense to hedge that. So Bitcoin is not just a hedge, but it is a hedge, right? Initially for a lot of people, that's how they're thinking about it. And then the journey starts, right? They'll learn more Bitcoin uh, bull markets and you know price. It'll start to become a more significant part of their portfolio that instigates further education and you just see people adopt it in different stages. But yes, those early stages, it's kind of like learn, ensure, hedge. Uh, I would say that's your first like few percentage points of like allocation. Like you're, you're one to 5% of your net worth in Bitcoin. Like you're kind of treating Bitcoin like a, like a hedge when you're at that stage. It is. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like you're not just saying to people, hey, you need to be a Bitcoin maximalist. Here's why. The, you know, the network <laughs> effect is going to take over. Here's the principles of sound money. Um, here's the adoption rate. Like here's, you know, really like making the case for number go up or, or adoption go up. Um, but I think, yeah, like kind of getting people to stick their toe in seems to be a more appropriate way. And um, I mean, I think it just makes sense. Like, you know, someone wouldn't go all in on something that they don't have conviction on. Um, but I think uh, a good way that you put it in, and I think this helps make people feel like they don't need to to become a maximalist immediately is like you, you write, uh, don't oversell your stake, pour too much gas on the fire or buy too much insurance. Um, and I think that that last point, uh, was really unique. Um, but it, it, yeah, just if you, maybe you could unpack a little bit more, like what that, that phrase meant to you. Yeah. So early on, I think that phrase means like, don't bite off more than you can chew. People are like, oh yeah, Bitcoin, it's the answer. 
I'm going to dump everything into it. And there's very little education to sustain them through the volatility. And so they'll get whipped up and sell and be like, oh, great, I made money. And then they're kind of out of Bitcoin, right? Not for the long term. Or they'll get whipped down. Like, oh, no, I lost a lot of money. I don't understand. And they'll sell, right? And so taking too big of an early bite, like, will choke you out, right? It's just not wise to uh, overstep what you're comfortable with. And then on the other side, the long end of the, the spectrum is like, hey, you you really can overdo it. I see some of these people, they're approaching a like a get on zero mentality and the volatility can, can whip you in that world too, right? Like, oh, I didn't see this unforeseen expense. I've got a hospital bill or, you know, something happened to the kid or my HVAC went out, right? And just having a reasonable amount of cash for myself helped me not sell Bitcoin when it was down, right? I had multiple medical emergencies in my family, HVAC went out all during the 2022 uh, bear market. It really was that cash buffer that helped me not have to sell Bitcoin when I didn't intend to. So not overdoing it can happen for an early Bitcoiner. And then even at those like last few, like, hey, I'm 98% of my net worth in Bitcoin. Like, okay, well that last 2%, like it's still serving some function for you. Let's talk about that. Like, is it is it the right amount? So yeah, overdoing it, I think that's what burns people on any point in the spectrum Um, because there's not intentionality like behind their decisions and sometimes they don't, they don't get to sit in the chair. I sit in and like see all the curveballs like that people are thrown in their life because that's often like, you know, day to day, week to week, there's going to be a fresh set of curveballs. And um, yeah, I'd say. That's, that's the, you know, don't oversalt the steak. You'll just want to spit it out. Don't put too much gas on the fire, like overdo it. Like, you know, be, be reasonable and very intentional because that's going to be the most sustainable. Yeah. And, uh, maybe you can, I assume this might be a, a, a common response to that. Maybe someone who's like really bullish on Bitcoin. They're like, Jesse, I believe in Bitcoin. This technology is, yeah. you know, you know, really world changing. Um, and I think the investment thesis makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I want to go all in and like, obviously that's someone's prerogative if, if they think that's, you know, financially reasonable. But I think the kind of perspective that you take is a little bit more nuanced where you see Bitcoin and its interaction with other types of assets. Um, so maybe you could unpack a little bit more about like how to think about position sizing of Bitcoin in the context of other assets like fixed income. I think um, I think that's really like in my mind, the battle that's happening is mm-hmm. how people try to plan for the long term. And it's, you know, U.S. government bonds versus Bitcoin yeah. with some rank real estate sprinkled in. So okay. um, maybe you could talk about like Bitcoin allocation in the context of those assets and in that insurance concept. Yeah. Yeah. So Bitcoin's opposite, right? It's natural opposite is government bonds. And that's where all the risk is. And that's where like the perfect hedge is as well, because government bonds are not just one thing, right? There's a 30 year treasury and there's a, you know, 30 day bill right and so the length of that bond uh, the yield curve like that that matters to a client's balancing if they're going from hey i'm going from bitcoin to a 30-year treasury like okay you're that that's a different move than bitcoin to like a a 30-day note or a money market fund right that holds treasury so the most natural opposite and often how we're counterbalancing a client's bitcoin position is with that cash or that really short-term treasury right because the 30 year one is what blew up all the banks, the 30 day one and and cash and like the most stable money for tomorrow, right? Your grocery store is probably not taking Bitcoin tomorrow. It's probably taking dollars and you'll probably want groceries tomorrow. So cash is still reasonable for a lot of people. It's the dominant medium of exchange in the world. So when you're going from Bitcoin to cash, like that tends to be a more um, reasonable balancing act than yeah. Hey, let's pick up 30 year treasuries and hold them till maturity. They're <laughs> not going to sustain in, in purchasing power, in my opinion, over, over that time frame. So I don't think that's a pr- very controversial, you know, given the problem set. But yeah, treasuries, a lot of nuance. Like, what do you say or what do you mean when you say treasury? Right? It can be very different things depending on uh, the maturity of that. And then your second question was real estate. Um, very um, common question. The short answer is real estate is not good money, right? Um, if you need $50,000, you can't just like sell off your bathroom tomorrow, right? And and have that be money. Real estate is very illiquid, takes 
30 days to sell. Um, it's not fungible. Your house is not the same as mine. And it just doesn't make good money. That doesn't mean it's not a good investment. You also want to give uh, credit where it's due. You can't live in a Bitcoin, right? Like it's, even though it might be a good investment asset, people still need roofs over their heads. So everyone has to, to some degree, answer the real estate question. Am I going to own? Am I going to rent? Advantages and disadvantages to each. Um, we have clients that do it all and it makes sense for their particular situation. So nuance is good. Real estate is a reasonable asset. It has uh, existed and provided a ton of value for thousands of years. And it's a question that everyone has to answer, right? They have a, a plan. They may not know it. It may not be explicit, but yeah, you have a real estate uh, plan. And then just how does that tuck into Bitcoin? It is different for people and yeah, pros and cons, but real estate, not a good money. Bitcoin, great money for the long term. Cash and short-term treasuries, good money for tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like you, in constructing a portfolio with Bitcoin on one end, and then you have short-term treasuries um, as like a complementary piece, you would almost, um, it seems like you have a very unfavorable view of long-term U.S. government debt. And I think that you, you said like that's where the risk is. Um, and I, maybe you could unpack that a little bit more. It's like, you know, people are buying these 30-year U.S. treasuries um, at, you know, a set interest rate. Um, you know, why would people be, you know, why is it likely that that interest rate won't make up for the inflation that um, I assume you envision may happen uh, over that time frame? Like, um, maybe you just unpack, like, you know, what some why someone would buy a, a 30-year U.S. government bond, um, where, you know, maybe that's even just an institutional allocator who's, you know, required to hold them given the pension regulations like you know what what is that market like yeah i think it's more in the latter than the former <laughs> i don't see too many people at least well i also sit in a very unique chair where a lot of people are you know curious about bitcoin if they're they found me um but i think it's more institutions that are required to and they're doing asset liability matching and they look at their um pension outflows and they have to have some sort of um stability within that and so a U.S. government bond will likely pay back its um, par value. It's just the pensioner receiving that paycheck that comes out of that distribution. Okay, well now maybe they've got ten dollar gallon gas or you know twenty bucks for a gallon of milk, and so it'll pay back. It just won't maintain purchasing power, and I think that's the risk, right? It's almost the the rabbit out of the hat. It's the magic trick of inflation. Like, oh look, you get your money back. Like, great investment. You know, you got interest all along the way, but it never kept up with what really mattered to you, right? Food, housing, energy, um, all these things that humans need, enjoy. Um, it's it's the sneaky trick, right? The the inflation is worse felt over decades. And I'll, often I'll, I'll really drive this home with clients if they're newer to the concept of inflation. I'll just ask them like, hey, what was the price of gas when you started driving? And for clients over, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old, it was way lower when it started driving than it is today. And it's like, well, the gas didn't get that much better, right? Same gas. It's just that inflation, you, you can feel it. Um, and yeah, I think that's um, a, a nice way to like tie it home for clients. Like, hey, your pension, it might last your full retirement, but it's probably not going to keep up in purchasing power through your full is retirement. It? Yeah. And do you have a perspective on how pension funds are managed and like another kind of regulatory stance? And um, I think like I might mean, have heard this first from like Greg Foss and like kind of one of his bull cases for Bitcoin is that it will exist as a means of pensions meeting those obligations. Um, if the, um, you know, those long dated U.S. treasuries um, begin to trade lower, um, like I, I guess I'm curious, you know, what is the dynamic there? Um, and like, how, how does that market function? Do you think that this, um, obviously pension funds are gigantic, like some of the, the largest, you know, pools of, uh, of assets in the world. Um, and how do you see Bitcoin playing into that potentially? I'm hopeful for it. Um, any people that work in pension fund, they can go read the financial plan riskier without Bitcoin. They, we could just retitle it like your pension is riskier without Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Because... You cannot be 100% certain that this will not work, right? And that's what you're saying when you don't allocate 
to Bitcoin. It's like, I'm a hundred percent sure that it will not work. And for me. the more you learn about it, the more that that question becomes questionable. I'm like, okay, I think it might be reasonable. And the pension should be looking at that. Like, is there any credibility to Bitcoin? Right. Okay. Maybe we start with one per- and it starts just like every person. They're not going to jump into the deep end, but slowly over time and pension funds are gigantic. You mentioned that that means they move slow, right? It's going to take a lot of compliance and due diligence and checking and, and checking the checking. Uh, so it, it will not be a quick process, but it will be rewarding for those pensions that move first because that purchasing power, if it can sustain, it's providing that hedge, you know, that insurance-like quality to the rest of the pension portfolio. Yeah, and um, I guess before we move on, you have another article you've written in Bitcoin Magazine, a little bit more focused on like tax strategy. But the the really the last piece I want to hammer home is like, Bit, we talk about Bitcoin as um, you know monetizing, and then conversely, you have other assets that are demonetizing. Um, would would be my assumption. Um, so, how do you see that risk management and that dynamic between Bitcoin and other monetary goods? And um, I would even argue, like you see, equities have been monetized. Like I think. Mm-hmm. Um, almost everyone I know is like, okay, well, I, I save by investing in yeah. the market and in real estate. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some bonds tossed in there, the classic 60, 40, but um, how do you like, how, how do you get across to people that they're like, what this essentially, this would be like, Bitcoin would be a tail risk to the traditional portfolio if it did monetize. Like, how do you have that conversation? Yeah. So everyone's coming from a different standpoint or a starting block of what they have but i like to bucket these into the big six and i think you mentioned all of them at some point at least in this conversation it's going to be equities stocks or or companies that you own that can be privately held as well Uh, fixed income so we talked about that long short very different there's a dynamic within fixed income so you've got to get that right there'd be commodities and and gold would be included in that Uh, so things that um, fungible they tend to balance um, near-term inflation so you look at those they're not great investments but their prices fluctuate and they're pretty uncorrelated to to other assets so that's a bucket Uh, we look at real estate right the most uh, lindy long-lasting investment of all time they're not making any more land but it's got a lot of drawbacks right you can't teleport it it's always going to have a jurisdiction which means it'll always be uh, a target for taxation um, and it's hard to um, liquefy right like you can't sell land or houses immediately at a market price so there's real estate Um, and then the final two would be uh, cash and bitcoin so talked about those as being like kind of dynamic and competing monies and to some degree everyone's got a mix of those six um, in some form or fashion, they're, they're all kind of in someone's life, um, to some degree. So we look at those and like, what's the plan? Where do we want the balance to be? It's not as simple as, oh, 60, 40. I'm just going to look at these two and ignore the other four. Um, we'll, we'll give them some credit and say they manage cash a little bit. Okay. Okay. 60, 40, uh, we'll call it 60, 39 and 1% cash. Like that mm-hmm. is a typical financial advisor portfolio for a modern retiree. I think it's not addressing the other stuff, right? The real estate, um, commodities, Bitcoin, and those things are important. They may not be intuitive for how they fit into a client's financial plan, but they're important. Yeah, awesome. Thanks Thanks for unpacking that a little bit more. Um, I mean, I, I hope that if there's, you know, a financial planner or, or, or wealth management um, professional out there that's listening to this, then, you know, maybe they wouldn't be necessarily like on the Bitcoin train, but maybe they can hear this and be like, okay, there's a reasonable take on why this is something I should explore. Um, and I mean, ultimately, I, I think it's kind of funny. I think there's so many people that have Bitcoin exposure that don't even know it yet. I mean, if you hold, um, you know, index funds that include MicroStrategy or uh, I guess, uh, I can't recall if Tesla sold all of their Bitcoin, but it's it's been in the mix nonetheless. And so, um, I mean, my perspective is that, you know, that percentage of that index fund would continue to grow. Um, you know, it remains to be seen, but uh, yeah. I, it makes me happier knowing that there's people out there that have Bitcoin that don't even know it yet um, in in the context of, of, you know, how they're they're storing their wealth. But uh, I, I kind of want to move on now to a little bit more of the technical side of what you do as a financial planner. And I, and taxes is, is a huge component of this. 
Um, and you have another article that we're going to uh, have down in the show notes. Um, and it's titled holding onto your Bitcoin and, uh, holding onto your Bitcoin, don't get killed on taxes. Um, and you paint, um, just a very easily digestible picture of what the landscape of taxation is, um, as it relates to capital gains, as it relates to, um, different forms of IRAs. Um, and so I, I think just like for someone as my, like young as myself, I, I don't really, I haven't given this much thought to be frank. Like I, I think like retirement planning has been, you know, for a long time was like not even on my radar. And then I did the math on social security and I was like, oh, maybe I should like kind of take some initiative here <laughs> and, and figure this out. Um, so I'm, I'm getting there, but you know, would love to be able to understand a little bit more. Um, first of all, like, you know, how do, you know, short-term versus long-term capital gains function? Um, and then we can kind of get into like how to limit, um, you know, the tax implications of selling Bitcoin. Cause, um, I mean, I'd love to be able to exchange Bitcoin for goods one day, but in the event that that doesn't happen, um, you know, for, for the things that I want, you know, I've got to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. And there's kind of a, um, a debate that I've seen in the, the Bitcoin community, right? Is, is it property or is it money? Uh, it's definitely trying <laughs> to be money, but it's taxed like property. Right. And that's where the capital gains come in. So if people are entering from the financial perspective, um, it kind of feels like property, right? And it's taxed like a stock or it's taxed like real estate. That if you have a gain, when you dispose of the, the asset, you've got to recognize that gain and pay taxes on it. If it's held less than a year, that's short term. Yep. Those tax yep. rates yep. are higher than if you hold it for over a year, which would be long term gains. So it can create this complexity, uh, whether you're selling it or using it. You probably can go somewhere and buy something with Bitcoin, but that is a taxable event in the IRS's opinion, right? And they don't see it as money yet. They see it as property. And so every transaction is a taxable event, um, the way the law reads it. Now, I'm hopeful that, you know, one day maybe maybe the IRS will like bend the knee, kiss the ring, yeah. however you want to put it, but yeah. like it's money one day. And then so you and I can give it back and forth to each other and there's not... Um, a basis that needs to be tracked or calculated or gained. And if, you know, you want to buy me a coffee, you just do it. And it's not going to have to be a thing on your tax return. Yeah. It's uh, not like, you know, to, today, you know, we're not looking at the DXY and like, you know, trying to understand the basis of the dollars that we received yeah. and then exchanged. Um, do you have a perspective on like, uh, th I mean, this is such a difficult thing to answer, but like long term, um, how do you, what are the, what are the probabilities you use to try and grapple with capital gains tax versus um, like Bitcoin being treated as money in the long long term game? Like, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, again, you know, they envision a future where Bitcoin is used as money um, mm -hmm. and they think about it in that way and they perhaps plan about their lives in that way. Yeah. Um, but the, in the event that like the regulatory system doesn't see it as such, I think people need to be prepared for what those implications are. Yeah. Um, so how do you like think about that? I'm I'm hopeful for it, but you have to have a plan if it if you're wrong, right? So I am very optimistic. I, I would hope that one day the IRS can get there and Bitcoin is money and it's not a taxable event. That'd be fantastic. But I, I don't see or sense that anytime soon. So what do I do with the uh, eight clients I have this year that are retiring, right? They're switching from accumulators to deemed accumulators and they, they <laughs> typically have a lot of Bitcoin. We're looking at how you be wise in that environment and, and reduce that friction of tax because it does exist right now. So um, yeah, it's more of an optimism and a hope. I do not know how the next 20, 30 years will go, but Bitcoin is doing its thing. It seems to be winning over the you know uh, long term, which makes me hopeful, but you can't know that that's going to happen. And for some people, they need to figure out what to do with their Bitcoin today. Right? And so, yes, the future will be great, but some people are having to live off of it now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you just got to navigate the current environment. Yeah, they typically right. change the tax code like in a significant way every five to 10 years. You know, big new set of rules come out and you're like, all right, well, here's, here's the hand we're dealt. We just got to deal with it and make the most of it. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. It's yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's, again, like takes it back to the beginning of the conversation where we were talking about people that have, say, 100% certainty that Bitcoin cannot function. Um, and on the flip side of that coin, there'd be like people that have 100% certainty that Bitcoin will become the money of the world. Um, and I think it's like, you know, 
helpful to think in probabilities because that can, you know, give you a more realistic picture of, you know, where things could go. Um, and then you can adapt to that accordingly. Um, but in terms of like the tools available to folks, I know this is something you focused on in your article is, um, you know, IRAs, like uh, maybe you can help educate us a little bit. You know, I hear, you know, Roth IRA, traditional IRA, 401k, like uh, maybe you can just give us like a brief crash course on like what these vehicles are um, and, you know, how they impact your, your taxes. Bitcoiners, it's time to upgrade the security of your stack. Bitcoin Magazine has partnered with Unchained, the leader in collaborative custody services to help you secure your Bitcoin with confidence. Unchained's collaborative custody services give you complete ownership over your Bitcoin while delegating one key to Unchained to protect you from theft and loss due to simple mistakes. Using Bitcoin native multisig, Unchained's client services can help you increase the security of your Bitcoin and gain access to the next generation of financial services. Whether you want to bypass exchanges and stack sats directly into cold storage with Unchained Vault or hold physical Bitcoin in your tax-advantaged IRA, Unchained makes it simple and safe to use the best practices available to store your generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 401ks, IRAs, and Roth IRAs are all retirement accounts uh, under the American tax code. So 401ks are on the employer side. They're typically... Um, taken out you know, of a paycheck, you'll contribute to a 401k every two weeks, twice a month, whatever it is, and it's an employer plan. So they're involved with the investment selection and the rules of uh, you know, how much you can put in, when you can take it out. But there's a lot of rules, restrictions, limits, and ages that matter in all of these types of plans. So if it starts with a 4, 401k, 403b, that's typically at an employer level means the plan is um, regulated and administered you along with other people. The IRA is, is the opposite in that it's individual. So it's an individual retirement account. And there's a far more, um, there's far more flexibility with the investment choices within an IRA because you're not having to design a menu that suits everybody. You say, hey, this is my IRA. I want to do what I want with it. And so often what you'll see is when people leave an old employer, they'll roll that 401k into an IRA, right? And so they're changing it from an employer plan to, hey, this is my money. I'm going to go do a little bit more of what I want to do with it. That rollover is not a taxable event. It's just kind of going under one, it's going from one roof to under another roof, right? And it's like, hey, I haven't taken that money yet. Uh, not taxable. I'm just going to pick some different investment choices with it. So that's the two uh, high level plan types, whether you're your group or individual. Then the second modifying component underneath each of those is traditional or Roth. And traditional just means I have not paid tax on this yet. So as it grows, it's not taxed while it's growing, but whenever I pull out of that traditional bucket, then it'll be taxed. And it's going to be taxed at those ordinary income rates, like the ones we talked about with Bitcoin under a year. So typically higher rates, but You've never paid tax on that money, so you can effectively put more dollars in. And if you're in a high tax bracket, right. that could make sense, right? Sometimes you can get 50 cents on the dollar, you know, more money in to a plan because you're not having to pay tax on it yet. So for high tax bracket people, traditional pre-tax is something you, you really want to look at. The opposite is the Roth, right? You can have the Roth in the 401k or the Roth in the IRA. But if it says Roth, it just means... I've already paid my tab with the IRS. Like I paid taxes on this. It's still in a retirement account, but whatever it grows to is tax-free in the future when I pull it out. And so there are age limits. Uh, you're typically looking after age 59 and a half, but you can get to that money tax-free. And tax-free is a very curious word. When I say it in people's eyes, like, okay, they're starting to think Bitcoin, right? And everyone's got their own moon math in their head. And like, well, I think Bitcoin's going to go to you know this price when I'm 60. Do that math. Uh, I, I won't disagree with you, but you'll connect the dots and Roths over time, especially with, with Bitcoin moon math, right? It can be a very powerful, um, powerful way that, hey, maybe that IRS doesn't ever bend the knee or treat Bitcoin as money with the Roth. Hey, I can pull that, that million dollar Bitcoin out tax-free when I'm age 60, all in one year. And I won't even climb tax brackets as I do it. And the basis didn't even really matter, right? I didn't have to track my gain. So they're just um, retirement accounts are just different buckets that you could put assets into and they've got rules around the pre-tax, post-tax, you know, 
tax-free. You, you want to look at your buckets um, and strategize with them in a way that makes sense. So this is very foundational work you do in financial planning. What assets should go into what buckets? When do I fill them up? And then when it all flips, what assets do I take out of what buckets in what order? Um, and then you're just looking for efficiencies to not have to pay more tax than you should uh, within mm-hmm. that process. Yeah. And as far as like getting Bitcoin exposure through an IRA, I think um, a lot of people would be like, oh, you know, that an IRA is how I'm going to hold equities a lot of the time. They're mm-hmm. like, yeah, put my money in there, I'm holding equities, uh, simple. Uh, but then I think this Bitcoin component adds a little bit of complexity there. Um, and so I know that SAT Advisory uses Unchained as the basis for helping clients secure their Bitcoin. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, the different options that people have. I mean, uh, ETFs yeah. obviously come to mind for a lot of folks. And maybe you can just explain to us how you communicate with clients on like what those options for Bitcoin exposure are and maybe you know what the, the trade-offs and benefits of each um, are. Mm-hmm. Um, it does go back to education, right? If someone's early on and they're looking for their first 1%, is it right to set them w- up with a collaborative custody, multi-sig, Roth IRA? Like, oh, geez, what is that? Right, that might be like too much into the deep end, right? That's a that's an option at an unchained level, but it's usually not the first person's like bite, right? And and six months ago, the ETFs did not exist. Yeah. Now they do. Yeah. And so you're seeing people be more open to that conversation of like, hey, we can just start, you know, we don't even need to have a new account. Like, let's just start to understand Bitcoin, right? We'll put it in there. You can track the price, ask questions. We'll learn as we go and then just try to make the next best educated decision right like hey we have a lot of clients that use unchained it is not a requirement um sound advisory as a company is held to a fiduciary standard that means they're just going to make decisions that are in the client's best interest right and sometimes that is i love bitcoin i want to hold my keys i'm never sacrificing that i've got this old 401k at work what's my offer hey, there, there is an option for that, right? We can start to look at an unchained uh-huh. product when yeah. it's the right fit for the yeah. client. Yeah. But it's not always because yeah. people yeah. just start from a different um, yeah, starting line at, at every point. So it's really reading that client and saying, well, ETFs are here and this client wants to learn. They probably don't want to get into the technicals of you know what an extended public key is and like I've got two of these things and what if I lose it, drop... So just make that next right decision for the client. Sometimes that is the ETF. Um, oftentimes as the education deepens, they'll graduate and develop a way to like a more key control type of method. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think it, again, like comes back to that education piece and how important that is. And um, yeah, I think like a lot of people look at an IRA and be like, oh, I'll just hold the ETF in there. But I think it is really interesting that there is the, capacity to hold the you in a multi, using multi-sig like you can hold two of the three keys um for your um bitcoin in an ira account mm-hmm. um and I, I think that that's just like something that a lot of people like don't really know yeah. um I, I think that like oh there is also the flip side of that coin where a lot of folks you know in the bitcoin space especially on twitter are, um you know KY, kyc regulation is something that they don't particularly like so they're like oh you know maybe i don't want to um, you know, engage with IRAs in this way. Yeah. Um, so on that note, like how are there situations in which people that have certain financial goals should not use an IRA? Oh, sure. If someone's committed to um, no KYC as a goal, IRAs like in and of their nature are, are KYC, right? They are going to need to know some sort of identity and there's going to be reporting that happens to the IRS every year. And so if you are a no KYC, uh, maximalist, right? Why would you pick an IRA? Um, that's just not going to be in line with your goals. Some people it's very much in line with their goals because they typically have a large chunk of money that's already in that system. And it's going to be taxed and penalized often at terrible rates if they pull it out early. So you can do one of those rollovers, bring it from one roof to another, get Bitcoin, hold a level of key control. And it's just making peace with those trade-offs, right? It is going to be a KYC product, but you're kind of making that uh, that trade for all the tax advantages that come with it. And so key control tends to be an educational step. Um, and then the IRAs 
are very closely related to taxation. Right? And so if we're looking at a client's tax picture, it just becomes a question of well, what's what's the reasonable set of trade-offs here? And so IRAs are not always, um, they're not the hammer you want to hit every nail with. Right? Hey. Uh, it's just a time and a place, like know the tools and how to use them well. But they, they can be powerful. There's trillions and trillions of dollars in the American retirement system. So a lot of money trapped there. And I'm happy to see that there's tons of products and offerings like looking at, well, how do we serve that market well? Yeah. And for folks that are watching along or other people that are, you know, in the financial planning industry, um, Jesse, I know you worked on a great report and it, it's titled the Definitive Bitcoin IRA Handbook. And this is like, it's a beast. It's like 50 pages <laughs> long of like, everything you need to know as far as like legal considerations, you know, tax structure, um, just like basic definitions, but like basically completely exhaustive. And we'll also have a link to this down in the show notes as well for people who want to do a little bit deeper of a dive there. Um, and so I, I, we've covered a lot of ground here, but I'm curious like how you yourself have constructed and, and analyzed your financial plan. Like um, maybe this can give insight into, you know, how other people should be thinking about it for themselves. Um, and also, you know, maybe talking with their financial planners, like what are the steps you take when you're like, okay, I need to make a financial plan. Like here's step one to get that going. Like what's, what's that process like? Yeah. So the question is step one. And then in the context of my own plan. Um, yeah, I I suppose, I mean, whatever you're comfortable answering it. Yeah. It's a step doc to your uh, your finances. No, I'm, I'm an open book. Um, And yeah, step one is the same for me as it is for clients, right? What are the goals? What are we aiming at? You, the biggest mistake I see, and it's very prevalent on things like Bitcoin, Twitter is you're playing someone else's game, right? Someone's like, Hey, you should lever your house and buy Bitcoin. Okay. Well, what if they're not in the same spot as you, right? What if they happen to be a billionaire? I don't know they might be playing a different game. Uh, they might not be retiring on less, um, you know, on more they're probably retiring on more modest assets, right? So likely <laughs> knowing the game you're playing, identifying goals, that's where you have to start because as I get into what I'm doing in my own life, that is not going to apply to the person retiring this year. It's just very different, right? They have a different starting point and they're aiming at something different. So goals, know the game you're you're playing and only play your game. Don't take advice from someone who's aiming at something different because they have no idea who you are, what you're aiming at, what would be good for you. So that's the first step is get really clear about what do I want in life? Because then you can start to make the resources drive and and push towards that. So for me, it's maximizing things I care about, right? I care about my family, care about the work I do. And that's ultimately um, helped me make life choices that hey, I get to work in Bitcoin every day and and talk to Bitcoiners about how to make good decisions. And then uh, something I'm trying to get better at is like call it at the end of the day, like I have to go become dad and and husband. And like, that is something I care about. And once I have those two things, like, hey, I'm going to aim for this in my career and this with my family, you can make the investments just always push towards those goals. So that's where you start. That's what I'm doing in my own life. Then everything underneath the hood, right? Whether it's taxes or this IRA account or uh, how do we deal with equity compensation? What should the cash flow and budget look like? We just, hey, are they going to support the main goals, right? Um, It gets nerdier the deeper you go into each person's specifics, but that's very high level advice is know what you're aiming at. Don't don't play someone else's game. Yeah, got it. Um, (laughs) And yeah, I mean, again, thanks for, for covering all this ground. I think that like for myself, I am particularly curious about this interplay between Bitcoin and other, um, assets. I, I think like, you know, growing up and within the fiat system, there's just very much an expectation of, you know, index funds and, you know, offset, I mean, just 60, 40 or 60, you know, 39, one, as, <laughs> as you said. And, um, I think it's, for me, it's just like very, it's going to be very interesting to see how um, wealth wealth advisors and also financial planners are looking at Bitcoin as if he comes further entrenched. I mean, we're, we're going to have essentially a full army of like BlackRock salespeople going around and, and making this case to to clients as well. Um, so it'll be really interesting to me how that that conversation mm-hmm. is is going to change. Um, and on that note, like you know, 
do you have a perspective on how wealth preservation has that conversation has evolved throughout your career? Um, I mean, for me, like a very formative experience was like 2008, like basically being having a seat to seeing what that did to people's livelihoods as it related to real estate. That was just yeah. you know, obviously devastating. And, and argu- arguably the response was in ways that people don't really fully appreciate yet. Um, so are there any changes underway in just markets that you can identify where you're like, hey, you know, maybe we should take a, a stronger look at, say, commodities, for example. Um, mm. These, you know, these things have been historically underinvested in or um, yeah, I guess anything yeah. that like really stands out to you is like a, a shift in the wind, so to speak. Yeah. So take taking your example of 08, right? And if someone was targeting wealth preservation, like you said, then it it leans to, well, preservation always leans towards diversification, right? Because if you're balanced, you're just going to be stronger. And so what is the right balance becomes the question for wealth preservation. Not everyone was preserving in 08. If you were an accumulator and just starting your career, 09 and you know, 2010, pretty good years to buy assets when they were down. And so accumulation, right? And so this does go a little bit back to what game are you playing? Are you trying to retire in 2008? Mm-hmm. Or are you trying to you know, stack assets, right? They're, they're very different strategies. To that degree, you ask, are things changing? Yes, Bitcoin is becoming increasingly adopted and I think it belongs in either conversation. Are you going to accumulate? Okay, Bitcoin's a very reasonable asset to include in the accumulation plan, right? This is the stay humble stack sats of the world. Like, hey, we're accumulating. We're just trying to build a position. Why? Okay, that's what let's do. Preservation, it's still reasonable. This is back to that insurance article. Okay, if we went through 08, how do we be as solid as possible? So we can still retire in the fall of 2008 and not have to sell things when they're down, right? So I would start with know the game you're playing. Are you an accumulator? Are you a preserver? It leads to different outcomes with how much Bitcoin is reasonable given that that goal. So the the change in the wind is ETFs are here. That's probably going to instigate some knowledge. Um, it won't go straight to key control because their incentive is to like, hey, the ETF, this is our product. We're going to sell this. It'll be so much easier. You know, don't don't manage the keys yourself. And they'll, they'll give that um, asset education and it won't get technical early on, but it's a start, right? And, and the ETFs are opening doors to conversations about what's what's reasonable, whether you're accumulating or preserving. Yeah, no, I mean... To reiterate, I think different strokes for different folks. And I yeah, think yeah. you did a really good way of, of describing that. I, I think like for myself, I'm like, oh, you know, Bitcoin, it makes sense. You need yeah. to buy it and make plans to buy more. Like that that's at least how I, you know, approached it for myself. But I think it's um probably good for me to understand when I'm communicating with folks about this, like there is a specific use for this asset in your own portfolio that that is unique to you. Um and is not my my yeah. exact use case. Um but um, yeah, I mean, overall, I re- really appreciate this just essentially crash course and like what it takes to begin to assess people's financial plans. I think that there's, this has been underrepresented in Bitcoin education. I mean, obviously the protocol level and kind of the, the investment thesis itself, I've been, um, you know, explored ad nauseum, but I think that there is like, you know, Bitcoin as a tool for accomplishing things mm-hmm. and how to go about doing that. Um, I think people could think a little bit more strategically about. So really appreciate you sharing those insights, Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'd also just love, like, is, is there anything left on the table that you would love to be able to um, give a shout out to where you're like, hey, I'm really passionate about X, Y, or Z in the financial planning world. And I wish more Bitcoiners understood this. Yeah, I I was shocked when, I so I've been to multiple Bitcoin events, conferences, meetups now, and I am a, a tax nerd. I love um I play chess to relax, right? My wife thinks I'm crazy, but it's just that strategic nature and how that overlaps with tax and Bitcoin. When I went to these events, I didn't see anything related to tax, right? I've been to large events, small ones. I'm like, oh, this is something I understand that it seems like the rest of the world might be missing. And tax is the biggest friction in most people's lives. Like many people will pay far more in tax than they ever do for a house. And so getting that right uh, in an objective way 
Like often I'm able to show a client, hey, look, if we do X, Y, and Z, you're going to save this much money. It's not really an opinion. We don't have to be right about Bitcoin. We're not picking, is Tesla going to be better than Apple this year? Those are all crystal ball type questions. With tax, it's like, hey, the code is long and complex, but if you can navigate it well, like move this from this bucket to this bucket, and you're likely to have, you know, this benefit, saves you thousands of dollars, go use those dollars to buy more sats if that's what you want to do, right? Yeah, so that, um, there's opportunity there. There, A lot of Bitcoiners aren't looking at tax and a lot of tax professionals aren't looking at Bitcoin. So I'm trying to help bridge those gaps and conversations, but in a way that's like, hey, this is to help clients, right? That is what the end, the end game is. Like, let's get those clients closer to those goals and often reducing the amount of tax that you have to pay is just going to ease that friction and it'll be a, a smoother ride there. So that's the big one. That's what I spend my time thinking and strategy, strategizing about and um, trying to find like applications for clients. So. Yeah, no, it sounds like that like Bitcoin and tax related mm -hmm. market niche is like fairly inefficient, like um, pretty, uh, I guess, illiquid, one might say. Like, yeah, you yeah. Know, there's not, not too yeah. many Bitcoiners that are also financial planners. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it's really, you know, interesting to hear you share that perspective. Um, yeah, thanks. And it, I guess I would posit that it's like the IRS is a little bit like taboo amongst like popular Bitcoin discourse. Mm -hmm. like, people, you know, don't really like to talk about that, that boogeyman, so to speak. Yeah. So I think it's good to at least like keep your, your eyes peeled for, um, how to deal with those situations. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I appreciate you like kind of yeah. carrying that, uh, that flag, um, out there. I think, uh, <laughs> nice. people important. are welcome to join me. If there's tax <laughs> professionals out there, like I'm trying to, um, yeah, make those bridges more, more crossable. So I'm working on it. Reach out. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And, um, on that note, like where can people connect with you, sound advisory and just like learn more about, um, you know, yeah. the kind of work you're putting out there as well. Yeah. So Sound Advisory is found at thesoundadvisory.com. So T-H-E, Sound Advisory. And we are on Twitter at my Sound Advisory. And then personally on Twitter, I'm at uh, Idaho Hoddle. So the state of Idaho is where I live. Ida. It's two H-O-H-O. So Idaho Hoddle. Okay. That's how you can find me. Awesome. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for joining us on the Bitcoin Magazine podcast today. Um, look forward to chatting soon. And uh, yeah. Best of luck out there to everyone on tax day. We got that coming up on the, on the 15th. <laughs> yeah. Um, May the so, odds be in your favor. Yeah. 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 Uh, cool. Awesome. Well, Jesse, thanks, man. Talk Thank soon. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. You too.